Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization's 2021 Open House, Behind the Scenes of Transportation Transformation. My name is Abby Hemingway, and I'm the Public Involvement Officer for the Space Coast CPO. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items about tonight's events. As a reminder, the Space Coast TPO adheres to Title VI policy. Public comments are solicited without regard to race, color, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, or family status. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something like this that looks like that's on your screen tonight in the upper right hand corner. You're listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. All attendees will remain in listen only mode with mics muted. We also uploaded some important documents that we will touch on tonight in the handout section of the attendee interface. Tonight, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to our presenters by typing in your questions into the question box feature. During the Q&A session, the end, at the end of the presentation, the questions will be answered in chronological order from when they were received. If we see the same question being asked multiple times, we may choose to address that in a bulk answer. Also, tonight's webinar is being recorded. So first, we'll be asking a series of engagement questions throughout the open house um, presentation by using Mentimeter. As this screen says, please make sure you grab your phone, tablet, or you can open an additional internet window and go to www.menti.com and use the code displayed here to enter. So we're gonna be um, familiarizing ourselves with this platform just real quickly to get the hang of it uh, by answering some of these questions. So make sure you keep this platform open. So the first question is, have you ever attended a Space Coast TPO event or public meeting? And we're gonna give a little bit of time to get logged in. So we have some answers coming in at real time. Looks like so far, most of you have not been to an event or public meeting. Going to give a little bit more time. If you're just now joining us, again, you can open a new window or use your phone or tablet. Go to www.menti.com. Use the code displayed here at the top of this slide to answer a few engagement questions. We're going to be using this throughout the night in our presentation. All right, we got some feedback coming in. Go ahead and keep that open. We're gonna go ahead into the next question. How did you hear about tonight's open house? Was it via email, our newsletter, word of mouth, Facebook, Nextdoor, Twitter, our website, or a different method? Again, if you're just now joining us, we're answering some engagement questions by using Menti. Go to www.menti.com and use the code displayed here at the top of our slide. We're gonna be using this throughout the night. So it looks like many of you have found out via direct email. We have some uh, social media channels or word of mouth. Few more answers coming in. If you're just now joining us, we are answering some engagement questions. We're gonna be using this platform throughout the night. If you open a new window tab, or you can use your phone or tablet, go to www.menti.com, and you can enter the code at the top of this slide. So it looks like many of you found out via email. We're gonna go ahead to the next uh, question. So this one is how long do you think the average transportation project takes to go from the planning process through construction? We have some feedback coming in. Most of you are kind of going between the five to 10 and 10 to 15 year range. Again, if you're just now joining us, we're answering some engagement questions. We're gonna be using Menti throughout the night. Go to www.menti.com and enter the code that you see at the top of this slide. We'll be asking questions throughout the night to get your feedback. 
All right. If you're not sure about the answer to this one, don't worry. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to our executive director, Georgiana Gillette, who will be chatting more about who we are, what we do, and how we implement projects. Georgiana? Thank you, Abby. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Georgiana Gillette, Executive Director of the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. We are so excited to have you with us this evening. Thank you for tuning in to learn more about our organization and how the region's transportation system is being transformed. But most importantly, we want to hear from you. Bear with me here, I'm trying, okay, I think I've, space bar it is. So what are we going to discuss tonight? The role of the Space Coast TPO and what transportation planning involves. Sarah will review some of our uh, multimodal transportation projects that will be implemented in the future. Stephen will discuss intelligent transportation systems or 21st century infrastructure. Kim will present on our Vision Zero program. And then finally, we will open it up to comments and questions. Your feedback is critical in developing our transportation plans. Our organization is governed under federal and state law. An urbanized area over 50,000 people must have a transportation planning organization to develop transportation plans and coordinate federal transportation funding. Transportation is a central component of our daily lives. It affects everyone and plays a critical role in our quality of life now and in the future. The transportation decisions we make today will have a direct impact on the economy of our region, uh, as well as the health and happiness of our residents and visitors. We were created to look at the big picture of transportation, coordinating among the different transportation agencies, municipalities, and our citizens. We plan for all modes of transportation, not just vehicles. So what does that look like on the local level? The TPO's governing board has 19 members, all elected officials, five county commissioners, one port commissioner, and 13 city council members. We meet monthly to develop transportation plans to fix short and long-term needs, determine transportation policies, and most importantly, mutually agree on state and federally funded projects to improve regional mobility for the entire county. It's critical that we view transportation holistically and that we talk to each other about how to improve it. So the TPO uses three primary sources of information. First, all year long, the TPO monitors the performance of the transportation system. We take traffic counts, analyze accident statistics, determine congestion levels, and a range of other monitoring activities. This gives us the technical information on where road improvements are needed. Second, the TPO asks each local government within Brevard County to submit specific project requests. And these can range from a, a major widening project to an intersection project or maybe even a sidewalk project. Third, the public requests improvements. Through the development of our various plans and in, in meetings like tonight, we listen to the feedback from our citizens. The TPO sorts through all of this information to ensure eligibility and consistency with other plans and to ensure there is local support at the respective councils and the county commission. Good transportation projects solve several problems at once and have broad community support. The projects are then prioritized on a list of priority projects and adopted each year. And then we submit that list to the Florida Department of Transportation for programming with available state and federal revenue. And I said state and federal only because we have no authority over local funds the county and the cities decide how those funds will be spent. 
So it can be a long road to implementation, uh, no pun intended. Uh, there is a process to identify, agree upon, and fund important transportation projects. It typically begins with a visioning or feasibility study. Um, the goal is to move projects from conception or concept to construction. If you are widening a road, it can take 15 plus years to work its way through the process and identify the available re revenue. And of course, the funds are categorical with many rules and every project is different. Um, and of course, public, public involvement happens throughout this process. So all of the work that the Florida Department of Transportation intends to take on over the next five years is listed in their five-year work program. We take the snapshot of the DOT's tentative work program and we build our own document called the Transportation Improvement Program. The draft TIP, we like to call it TIP, uh, is open for a 30-day public comment period. We have the document uploaded in the webinar, and Sarah will show you how to locate that document on our website. It covers five years, fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 26, and it lists projects by mode or category. It includes sections for highway capacity, spaceports and seaports, aviation, transit, technology, bicycle and pedestrian improvements, safety projects, and, uh, and last but not least, maintenance projects. The TIP includes 315 projects totaling approximately $1 billion over the next five years. And this is real money on real projects to improve our transportation system here in Brevard County. And Sarah will touch on a few of those trending projects, but there are many more included in the TIP. Um, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Sarah, but first I'd like to ask you one question uh, via Mentimeter, and that is, do you feel that there is adequate funding to meet our transportation needs? And I see answers coming in. Uh, it is... Uh, very interesting. At first we were almost split, but no uh, seems to uh, be the most responses. We'll give it just a, a few more seconds. Okay, great. So that is really good feedback. Um, most of the funding for transportation comes from motor fuel. And the federal gas tax has not been raised since 1992. Meanwhile, the cost of materials, labor, and right-of-way acquisition costs have increased considerably. In 2020, Florida had more than 60,000 registered electric vehicles. And by 2025, electric vehicles will impact the Transportation Trust Fund, because as you know, electric vehicles do not pay any gas tax. So the reason why we're not building more is we are constrained by our revenue. So the answer is no. Uh, we have uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of needs in our long range transportation plan that we do not have the available funding uh, to be able to fund over the next 20 years. So very good feedback and I appreciate your time on that. And at this point, I will turn it over to Sarah. Good evening, I'm Sarah Kroll. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner with the Space Coast TPO. I will be reviewing some of what Georgiana just discussed in more detail, as well as also highlighting some of the projects that are in our list of project priorities and our Transportation Improvement Program. So how are projects selected and prioritized? Basically, what's the background of how projects become roadways or sidewalks or bike lanes or trails. Well, all projects really start in our long range transportation plan. This 
is a document that sets the vision for the area and allocates federal transportation funding onto projects. It looks at a 20 year time frame and is fed into by not only our local municipalities, but also our bicycle pedestrian master plan, our ITS master plan, Vision Zero program, and other projects and priorities that we have. This, these projects then can be fed into our list of project priorities via our annual call for projects where local municipalities can actually choose projects out of the long range transportation plan to submit as a project for the list of project priorities. These are unfunded multimodal projects and really is the document that bridges the long range transportation plan and the transportation improvement program. This is adopted annually and currently the draft is in review. The list of project priorities then moves into the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, after, after funding has been placed on the projects. So basically, if a project receives funding, it's now part of the TIP. And this is the implementation arm of that long-range transportation plan. The program's capital investments over the next five years is annually adopted and is currently in review. So where do you find these documents and how can you review them? So if you go to our website, spacecoasttpo.com, and you click plans and programs on the main page, a drop-down box will appear. You can click the second one to the bottom, or from the top, is a long-range transportation plan. So you can click that and browse the document and the process to development of the document. And then if you click the one underneath it, that's a transportation improvement program. Scroll down and you'll find basically where the new draft has been posted for public comment. And um, we are right now welcoming public comment on the TIP until it's adopted on July 8th by our governing board. <clears throat> Same thing with the list of project priorities is currently under review. And so you're welcome to um, review that and make any comments and that'll be going to adoption on July 8th as well to our governing board. To access the project priorities list, you click projects and studies on our main page, project priorities, scroll down to where it says draft list of project priorities, and you can access the document there. If you have any trouble reaching any of these documents, please feel free to email the Space Coast TPO staff. To I wanted to review some of the projects and that are on the list of project priorities and within the tip. And so we're just gonna go through a couple of them because there are tons of them. So um, these are just some highlights. So our number one project priority is the Ellis Road widening from John Rhodes Boulevard to west of Wickham Road. Um, currently it is under design with the design wrapping up later this year and the right of way is fully funded. Um, however, the construction has not been funded. This is at such a vital project in our area because it really links the new I-95 interchange to economic generators in the South Brevard area, as well as also the Melbourne Orlando International Airport. So that is our number one priority project. Two other projects that are very vital to our area is in along A1A and Cape Canaveral. The first is Long Point Road to George King Boulevard. This is a curb and gutter project or a multimodal project that includes curb and gutter, medians, and multimodal improvements such as a cycle track and um, sidewalk. It is currently under design, right-of-way and construction are not funded. So this project is on the list of project priorities. Now the International Drive to Long Point Road section is, is in the tip. It is not in the list of project priorities because it is fully funded and this project is currently under design and includes intersection improvements as well as also sidewalk improvements. Both these projects will be coming to the public um, via public meetings early fall, late summer timeframe this year. <clears throat> the TPO recognizes that A1A is a vital corridor for our communities in Brevard County. So we do have other projects happening along the corridor, not just in Cape Canaveral. Um, there was a new project request in Cape Canaveral and Cocoa Beach to do a complete street study from 520 to International Drive. We've also continued coordination with FDOT and local agencies in regards to safety projects along the corridor. And we have three sidewalk projects on our list of project priorities. They are Volunteer Way to Roosevelt Ave and Satellite Beach. This is a new project submitted this year. O'Galley Boulevard to Volunteer Way. This is Indian Harbor Beach and the right of way is 
currently funded and the design is complete. And then finally, Gross Point Ave to Flugav and in the Atlantic, and that is an unfunded project. Another amazing multimodal project that we have in our tip is State Road 520 from Aurora Road to Hubert Humphrey Causeway. This is an amazing project because it took a 2015 FDOT corridor study and combined those recommendations with a resurfacing project through a partnership with FDOT, the Space Coast TPO, and the City of Cocoa. So this project is currently in design. It's fully funded for construction in fiscal year 2023, and it will include rehabilitation of the pavement, buffered bicycle lanes, a parking lane, curb extension, enhanced pedestrian safety. Finally, the last project that I wanted to highlight is the Space Coast Trail. This is a very vital and vital section of regional trail that's in Titusville. It's part of the Coast to Coast Trail, which runs from St. Petersburg Beach all the way across the state to Playa Linda Beach. It's also part of the St. John's River to Sea Loop, which encompasses five counties along the um, eastern, north and central area of Florida, coast of Florida. It's the, and this is the number one priority trail on, for the Central Florida MPO Alliance. It was previously funded, it's currently under design, and we are pursuing construction funds to implement this amazing trail project. So that's just a couple of highlights that can be found in those documents. If you'd like to review these projects and more, you can visit our website and view our draft transportation improvement program and also draft list of project priorities. And they will be going to our board for adoption on July 8th. And before I turn it over to Steve, I do have a Mentimeter question. So that was a highlight of some of the projects, and obviously there was a variety of different types of projects. But what type of transportation projects would you like to see more of in your community? You can choose up to three. So is it roadway widenings? Is it sidewalks, public transit, intersection improvements, safety improvements, trails, bike lanes? There's something that we missed, you know, feel free to type it in the question box. So it looks like trails is currently the, the highest or the most voted for, followed by intersection improvements. Oh, now they're tied. All right, so it looks like really trails and intersection improvements. So that'll stay open while I turn it over to Steve. And with that. All right, thank you everybody. Man, for all of those interested in intersection improvements, I have some good stuff for you. Um, so uh, my name is Steven Bostel. I'm the transportation program manager for the TPO. And I'm going to talk to you today about intelligent transportation systems and the planning that we are working on in our area for them. And so intelligent transportation systems defined as the USDOT are the application of advanced information and communications technology to surface transportation in order to achieve enhanced safety and mobility while reducing the environmental impact of transportation. And so in short, you know, transporting everyone, utilizing our existing infrastructure in a more safe, efficient manager, man, man, uh, excuse me, um, manner using uh, technology. All right, so <laughs> I'll try that again. Um, I'm Stephen Bostel, the Transportation Program Manager with the TPO and I have the privilege of planning for intelligent transportation systems. And they're defined by the USDOT as the application of advanced information and communications technology to service transportation in order to achieve enhanced safety and mobility while reducing the environmental impact of transportation. And so in short, it's really using technology to um, move everybody in a more safe, efficient manner. And a lot of them are centered around intersection improvements as well.
And so with that, I have a quick video to give an introduction of um, what exactly ITS is. Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization here with some technorific news about the current state of our area's growing intelligent transportation system and how our tax dollars can transport us into a safer and even more money-saving, tax-saving, and connected future. All of the intelligent transportation technologies we'll see, current, coming, and future, enable our local travelers to be better informed and make safer, more coordinated, and smarter use of transportation networks while saving money, fuel, and time. Most importantly, our intelligent transportation system will save our local tax dollars in the long run. We'll look at the technologies that are currently deployed, the new tech that's already on the way, and some future tech that's truly game-changing if we choose to adopt it. Let's take a little trip to a local intersection and look at the technologies currently deployed there. Here, we see the intersection of Pineda Causeway and Wickham Road. Let's look at our already deployed closed circuit television, known as CCTV, and vehicle detection sensors working alongside the high-speed network beneath our feet. And then add in the future possibilities. There's more to our intelligent transportation system than meets the eye as CCTV allows traffic management staff to get a real-time look at traffic flow and watch for accidents. Vehicle detection with its special sensors automatically detects the presence of vehicles and obstructions on the roadway and instantly warns the management center. Meanwhile, our already on the way crosswalk detection software will use similar vehicle detection sensors to check for people in the crosswalk and warn oncoming traffic day or night and in all weather conditions. Now, let's add in some other existing possibilities, like Bluetooth technology, which can detect the speed of vehicles entering and exiting the roadway. The traffic management center now not only sees the intersection, but has much deeper traffic flow data to use for safety and roadway improvements. Speaking of traffic management centers, our new traffic management center is being envisioned as we speak. We're really excited about it. It's the brains of this entire operation, after all. Let's travel to another location and look at some more future possibilities. This is the intersection of US-192 and Hollywood Boulevard. In addition to the technologies we've already seen, this intersection employs another modern technology called signal coordination. Signal coordination uses the vehicle detection sensors to allow other intersections upstream and downstream to communicate with each other and work together to predict traffic flow and adjust the signals, improving traffic flow and saving travelers even more time and money. With the addition of roadside units, direct communication with vehicles becomes possible, providing instant traffic notifications like red light wait times. And with onboard units installed in vehicles, the possibilities are even greater, as vehicles could then communicate directly with each other and the surrounding infrastructure, increasing travel efficiency, safety, and hopefully less road rage. And of course, high above the hustle and bustle, next generation drones could not only ferry our online purchases, but provide first responders a bird's eye view of accidents, or even provide updates to your smartphone about foot traffic at a concert, festival, or rocket launch. Of course, new technology is an investment. Our hardware must be updated, maintained, and secured in order for future components to integrate seamlessly in the same way that we wouldn't hook up a supercomputer to a dial-up internet connection. In the present and in the future, all of these technologies acting together increase safety, optimize our existing infrastructure, and save taxpayers time and money. Well, what are you waiting for? Get involved and support the future of our intelligent transportation system. Let your local elected officials know that you support enhanced traffic operations. Learn more at spacecoasttpo.com. Thanks for watching. All right, and so. The video gives a quick overview, you know, to let us to let everyone know the type different types of 
um, technology that we already have deployed here in Brevard and kind of some of the things that we're looking into incorporating in the future. And so we, we do have a very extensive system right now. Um, on We've got technology deployed on Palm Bay Road, US 192, parts of US 1, State Road 520, uh, State Road 405 up in Titusville, and also on Courtney Parkway in Merritt Island. And so with all of those assets deployed, um, agencies are able to monitor and manage traffic flow and coordinate uh, the traffic signals. And this all pro and also provide different alternate route routes, you know, and some of those dynamic mesh signs that you see on I-95 and the arterial roadways. And getting all of this information back to the traffic management centers and to road rangers gives them the information that they need to better respond to incidents. And so something that's been recently deployed on transit is a real-time monitoring of the buses. So transit users are now able to go on to the 321 Transit app on the App Store and actually be able to see where the buses are located on the route, whether they're running on time or not. And so this really saves people from waiting out in the hot sun longer than they have to or in the rain. And it, it's also we're improving on time reliability as well. And so those are some of the things that exist, but we're also working on planning for the future of, of technology as we know it changes and rapidly evolves as we've seen in the past 20 years or so. And so our ITS master plan has come up with around 126 projects that look at doing intersection improve, improvements that signalize intersections and unsignalized intersections. Um, deploying technology that helps with bicycle and pedestrian safety and intersection safety and working on uh, better event management and evacuation and something new we took a look at was how we might be able to help people park more efficiently at some of our beachside parking areas and downtown parking areas. And so intelligent transportation systems really have a, a great benefit to cost ratio so the around seven to one. So that means that the, the plan costs will be around $95 million, um, but the benefits are estimated to be around $655,000. And so that looks at safety benefits and time and fuel savings. And something that's really exciting about these projects is they can be done pretty quickly within you know four years, five years. Um, and that's really fast compared to traditional projects that Georgiana and Sarah talked about that can take, you know, 15 to 20 years. And it really sets us up for the future of transportation uh, with connected vehicles coming in the future. By having, you know, our network built out and all of these things deployed, we can add on to it for whatever comes our way in the future. And then all of these things have to talk back to somewhere in order for people to make decisions. So. Our traffic management center has been continuously evolving over time. Um, you can see in 2009, um, it was just one office. and 2019, we're in a little bit bigger office. And so with all of these new things coming online, um, we're looking at working with Brevard County and our local agencies to uh, construct a larger traffic management center. And this is currently our number three on our project priority list. And Brevard County is currently working on designing the facility. And we still have yet to find money for construction. So that's something we're all actively working on. And so with all of that, that is our future of transportation and intelligent transportation systems. And so we'll switch over to another Mentimeter question. And um, when are you considering purchasing an electric vehicle? Um, Georgiana mentioned that they, they don't purchase or contribute to the gas tax if they don't use gas. And so it's something that um, depend on the adoption rate and everything. We're really taking a closer look at how to fund transportation in the future as more of these vehicles become prevalent on our roadways. All right. So it looks like uh, most of us like our, our gas vehicles for the most part, but are thinking about an electric vehicle at some point in the future, possibly. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Kim, who's going to talk about our Vision Zero program. Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Kim Smith, and I am the Education and Safety Coordinator for the Space Coast TPO. I also am the Vision Zero Project Manager. So I also have a mentee question for you. And my mentee question is up to what percent can roundabout reduce traffic fatalities? All right, looking good. I was all excited there at the beginning. It looked like you guys were gonna hit it spot on. Um, roundabouts can reduce traffic fatalities, our most serious crashes, obviously by 90%. Um, the typical type of crash you get with a roundabout are rear enders and the side swipes that don't typically have the serious injuries associated with them. Okay, so safety is the number one priority of all Space Coast TPO projects. In July of 2019, the Space Coast TPO ado adopted a Vision Zero approach to traffic safety. Vision Zero is based on the idea that serious and fatal crashes are preventable and that zero is the only acceptable number of those type of crashes. Here are some key differences between a traditional approach like we've been using for many years and a vision zero approach. All right, next I'm gonna uh, show a, a short video and the, this video will show how high, will highlight how transportation planning, emerging technologies and human be behavior can come together to end roadway tragedies. Imagine her world in the year 2050. A colony on Mars, bloodless surgery, clean, sustainable energy, the future makes almost anything possible, including zero roadway deaths. I am confident we can do this together. We must. And the groundwork that this organization, this coalition has built together over the years will be a key part of that. Three strategies will lead the way. Countermeasures that work have already saved thousands of lives. We will double down on what we know works. We shouldn't forget about tried and true non-tech interventions that are out there also ready to be used. In 30 years, from 1994 to 2014, miles traveled increased 35%, yet traffic fatalities decreased by 5%. Countermeasures work. Safety belts and airbags, DUI checkpoints and laws, red light cameras, traffic roundabouts, and child restraint systems. The road to zero will accelerate the development of Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, or ADAS. Human drivers are fallible. Drivers are tired. Drivers are impaired. Drivers are distracted. Smart machines are not. New ADAS technology is being added to new cars every day, at all price levels. Car makers have voluntarily agreed to add AEB, automatic emergency braking, to all new cars by 2022. There's really a remarkable number of technologies that are really coming way down in price. So uh, camera technologies that can uh, have special, essentially computer vision that look out ahead of you and can detect stopped cars and threats, uh, pedestrians that are about to cross in front of you. Human behavior is such that uh, only technology can override the poor choices that people make when they're operating a vehicle. Culture and behaviors can change. We can seek to make safety a priority within our personal lives, within our businesses, corporations, uh, associations, our neighborhoods, schools, 
50 years ago, people freely littered. Millions smoked in public. The use of safety belts was not the norm. People can change. The road to zero requires a rigorous adoption of safety culture. Safety needs to be a priority. It needs to be part of our culture. Yo no cree es posible hacerlo. Today, her future is already on the road to zero. The map is clear. Evidence-based solutions are being funded. The journey has begun. Achieving zero roadway fatalities is not impossible. It just hasn't been done yet. This is our generation's moonshot. All right. I love that because a lot of people when I talk about Vision Zero think I'm a little crazy. So I like that last last comment in that thing about it just hasn't happened yet because I believe that we can get there. All right. So since 2019 in the two years since we started down this road to zero, we feel like we have reached some key milestones. Um, a year after we started, we were able to adopt our action plan and it outlines our steps that we plan to take for reaching that all important number of zero. And then in, in October of the same year, we were able to release a toolkit to all of our local municipalities that helps them design their own plans. Also, um, you can see that um, wait a minute. Oh, oh. I'm not advancing here, guys. Oh, <laughs> it's going it's going slower than I want it to. So also you could see where cities such as Satellite Beach and Coco have also joined um, us along the way, and we are in conversations with other cities that are also interested in joining us in this Vision Zero idea. Data is an important key to Vision Zero. And what we take, what we do is we take crash data and we look at it, we pull it out, and we, de we determine where our most serious and fatal crashes are occurring, how they're occurring, is it red light running, is it speeding, and then we put it into a high injury map similar to the one that you see here. And this will aid us in deciding where resources need to go, what type of planning we need to do, what kind of outreach programs, and is very useful to helping us reduce the type of crashes that we're trying to reduce. We also work with our state partners. One of, um, one of our really strong partners that we have is the Florida Department of Transportation and their Bicycle Pedestrian State Coalition Alert Today Florida. If you drive in the Coco area right now, you may see this branding on the buses. Uh, we have bicycle and pedestrian safety messages that are running on our transit buses right now. We're real happy to see that out there. This same branding is also on four different billboards in the Palm Bay area. In addition to what the TPO is doing, we also have um, a lot of our, our local municipalities that are doing things that are going to help us improve traffic safety as well. The city of Melbourne is taking a, a different approach, a traffic safety approach to help with the panhandling and some of the homeless problems that we have in and around. And they're using a traffic safety approach to, to help with that and we're, we're on board with what they're doing and think they're taking a solid approach to that. Satellite Beach is doing a, a lot of great things. One of the things that we really like is they brought in their youth council and their youth council is actually working. They just recently in the month of May completed a meme contest where they had folks throughout design safety memes and then they ran them on social media. There was some really cute ones. Um, Coco, we mentioned them. They just recently adopted a Vision Zero 
resolution and they have committed to developing an action plan so extremely proud of that that is what it's that's what it's going to take and in the city of palm bay they recently trained quite a few officers in in bicycle and pedestrian safety so they can take those messages out into the public so <clears throat> Did I? Hold on. Sorry. I think I. Nope. All right. So most of us don't have to go very far to know somebody or have our own family member that have been affected by a serious traffic crash. Um, the the quote that you see right here is actually somebody in our office. You saw her at the beginning of this presentation, and her life was tremendously affected by by a traffic crash. All of our road users have the right to arrive at their destination safely. And no matter how we travel, motor vehicle, bicycle, or walk, we all play a role. Your role is begin the traffic safety conversation at home with your family. Be a good role model behind the wheel. Safety doesn't happen by accident. Slow down, stop for red lights, stop signs, and don't drive distracted. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. So at this point in the program, before we transition into the Q&A session, because we want to leave lots of time for questions, we want to hear from you. So go ahead and get your phones, tablets, or open that new window to answer some questions on Menti about some demographic information. It's just a couple of questions. The results will be hidden for this, so you won't see them in real time. Um, these are statistics that we um, that we collect for demographic purposes to report to FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration. So we're just going to give a couple more seconds for the age range. And next, we're going to go ahead and please select your ethnicity. There is an option on here if you prefer not to answer. Give a couple seconds for this one. And then our last one is please enter your zip code. We're wanting to see where all of our different uh, residents are coming from tonight since this was a virtual meeting. We hope it's from all different places over the county. Just a couple more seconds. All right. So thank you all for your participation. We're now going to shift into the Q&A session, but before we do, if you choose to sign off at this point, we want to thank you for attending tonight's open house to learn more about transportation transformation. Please be sure to follow us on social media. You can also uh, visit our website at www.sctpo.com or spacecoasttpo.com. Both will get you in the right place. Make sure you follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter, and please, please, please attend future meetings and events like this. We will continue to hopefully host uh, virtual webinars as well. And Lastly, before you sign off, there's a few ways to contact us here. You can um, email us your question if you don't want to stick around for the Q&A at TPO staff at SETPO.com. You can give us a call or you can visit us at our office in Vieira. But for now, we're going to go ahead and shift over into the Q&A session. So before we begin answering questions, um, please feel free to submit in the question box at this time. Um, we are going to answer them in the order that they were received. Again, if um, if they were answered, if the same question was answered was asked multiple times, we're going to try to answer that in one bulk answer. We'll try our best to cover everyone's questions. We left lots of time for questions, um, but again, if you would rather submit at a different time, email space uh, TPO staff at SCTPO. Com. And I'll go ahead and Laura, if you wanted to um, let us know what questions are we getting. Thank you, Abby. Um, I'm going to start with those that we received first and move down as many as we can. Um, the first question is regarding the East Ugali Boulevard. This would be the segment on the beach side going from Patrick Drive over to State Road A1A. Um, this individual knew that there was a study that was done a few years ago and was wondering what is um, the latest information on that and would like to see a sidewalk from the Charlie and Jake's all the way to the beach. 
Um, I believe that we received some information this past week and I will turn this over to Kim Smith, but I think she has the latest information she was sharing with DOT on what they were doing. Um, yes, they've actually just completed a study in that area. We have not had time to, to dissect that report. It's a very long report, um, but they, they do know that there is a need there. It's a 1.2 mile stretch of roadway with no controlled intersections. So DOT has completed a pedestrian safety study in that area. And if you would like to find out more about that, go ahead and email me and we'll try to pick out the highlights out of that report and, and let you know what they're recommending. Thank you, Kim. The next questions revolve around trails and I'll ask Sarah to respond to these. There were some questions that came in kind of getting um, to the point of what all these trails exactly mean, what kind of surface are they, and how long exactly is the Space Coast Trail on our project priority list that Sarah presented on? So yeah, trails can mean different things and depending on where, what the context is. And so, you know, we could be, when we refer to trails, we are usually referring to paved, multimodal, um, non-motorized user trails. And so that's, for example, what the Space Coast Trail is, is that is going to be um, mostly a 12 foot wide in some areas. It, could be smaller due to environmental impacts. Um, and so it, it will be a multi-use trail that is paved. And so um, for non-motorized vehicles, you could also, when we refer to trails, we might be discussed referring to a um, unpaved trail, such as, um, you know, the, the we have a, a um, excuse me, one of our showcase trails is located on St. John's property and thus parts of that are unable to be paved and thus are, are unpaved. We also, for example, the rail trail in North Brevard, um, 5.4 miles of that consists of a um, equine trail, so a horse trail alongside the multi-use trail. And so that is an unpaved section that is just grass um, that are, is for horses in the area to use. So trails can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and they also have a lot of different benefits to our community as well. And so we try to match the trail to that community and what their needs and, and wants are. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, this next question will be for Stephen. It's asking about the ITS interface and the timing of the railroad crossings with the increased frequency and speed of both our freight and upcoming passenger rail traffic. How is the ITS going to serve the timing with the railroad crossings? All right, so great question. Um, there's already some level of coordination between the, the rail crossing and the signals, um, mainly in the fact that, you know, once the train comes, it gives priority to the north-south movements, namely US-1, um, so you're not stopped there um, watching the train go by uh, right next to you. Um, and then after the train goes by, it gives priority to the east-west movements. Um, so we're hoping um, with ITS deployments with along some of these, these areas in the future, some more advanced um, things we might be able to do is, you know, if the train's a couple miles away or whatever the safe distance is for people to still keep crossing, um, we can have it geofenced, um, you know, kind of know where the train's at and that can give priority to the east-west movements before the train gets there um, and hopefully clear out some of the traffic. And so, um, but we're hoping with the passenger rail, you don't have to wait too long um, and, um, but that's some of the things that we'll be able to work on. Thank you, Stephen. There's been a couple of questions following up about where can individuals find information about upcoming projects, uh, specifically probably on our website. And I know, Sarah, that you presented that early on. Um, and I'll call on you because I don't remember exactly where it is on our website at the moment. Um, but that would be found in our project priorities. Those are unfunded projects though. Those wanting actual funded projects that are in the pipeline, you would need to visit the transportation improvement program. But I'll let you, Sarah, go over again how to access those documents. 
Excellent. I pulled the slides back up. Um, and so if you go to spacecoasttpo.com, that's S P A C E C O A S T T P O.com. And up top, there is a menu bar. If you hit plans and programs, you can go to the transportation improvement program. Those are the funded, funded projects. So these are projects that have money on them and are being implemented. Um, and so you can review those projects. Those would be upcoming projects. Many of those also have web pages on cflroads.com. That's cflroads.com. That's an FDOT website. For the list of project priorities, these are the unfunded needs or partially funded needs. So for example, um, one of the projects on A1A is, is funded through design, but not funded for right of way or construction, so it's still on the list of project priorities, and it's in the tip. Um, and so those projects you would find at um, underneath the projects and studies tab, project priorities. And so both of those pages are where you would see those draft lists. They will also, as I previously mentioned, be presented at our July 8th governing board meeting. Thank you, Sarah. Next question is regarding Vision Zero. Um, and it's wanting to know if road diets are still part of the Vision Zero planning. That, that would be a strategy. And also with that, are there any roads in Brevard County that have implemented bicycles may use full lane? That might be a combination of uh, Kim and Sarah. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start with this. Yes, definitely road diets would be a strategy that would fit in with, with Vision Zero. Um, Vision Zero does take a safe system approach. They want to reduce lane widths, lower speeds, and of course that's all part of the, the road diet philosophy. So certainly if we had a good candidate for a project like that, it would be something that would be considered. Um, I would also say that I know that, or at least I think I remember correctly, when they put the Sharrows on, I've lived here all my life, I should be able to get this right, NASA, NASA Boulevard that runs along the south side of the airport, um, there, I do believe that there are the bike may use full lane signs there as well. The Shero, that pavement marking that looks like a Chevron, is designed to be used with that bikes may use full lane sign. So um, any place they have those sharrows, and I know that's limited right now, that sign should be in use. I believe also, um, don't quote me, but I believe Florida Ave also has the signs up as well, along with the sharrows. But um, it's important to remember that bicycles are able to you know, take the full lane, whether or not the sign is is posted. And Kim, if you have anything else to add to that, since you are heavily um, involved in bicycle laws and are much more knowledgeable than I am. Well, when you when you say they have the right, to, you know, you are supposed to share the lane. Um, the, the the taking the lane comes if it's a substandard lane width. The problem is some of our Florida laws are a little confusing. Um, so I think a substandard is actually considered anything less than 14 feet. Well, 14 feet is really wide, but um, you know we all have to to use some obviously brain power here. And and if you have enough room to share, we should be trying to do that. But um, the the bikes definitely do have have a right to the lane in a lot of in a lot of cases. Thank you, Kim. I couldn't remember exactly what the cutoff was with when they can take the lane, so I appreciate you chiming in. Okay. Um, we've got another question. Oops. Sorry about that. That came in regarding uh, pedestrians and the new bright line. Um, where can someone find information on impacts to the pedestrian crossings due to the new, due to the construction coming with bright line? Um, Georgiana, you may want to speak to this. I know that we don't have a lot of access to that as Brightline is a privately funded company. Yes, um, I do know that uh, Brevard County uh, is working 
very closely with Brightline concerning the uh, the um, the crossing improvements, the safety improvements, and there have been conversations within some of the cities within Brevard County as far as any pedestrian improvements at the crossings. So no, we have not been involved in, in the review of the plans, um, but that would be Brevard County that would be um, kind of overseeing that. But safety improvements at the crossings uh, are being implemented um, throughout the county. Um, and, and that's a very important uh, part of the project. Um, but we can certainly try to get you some more information if you would um, want to leave us your telephone or leave us your contact information or, or call our office and we can try to get you more information depending on the exact location that you're interested in. Well, and if I could just add one of the things in one of the action items in our Vision Zero plan um, anticipating the arrival of Brightline service through Brevard County is an education and outreach to yes. um, let folks know how, you know, how to act ar around the trains, the differences in the speed. I can tell you the state partner that I mentioned alert today, Florida already has a video that you will be seeing a lot more of the closer we get to Brightline um, making their arrival in Brevard County. In fact, I think currently with Brightline schedule, I think currently we're anticipating kicking off an educational campaign beginning as early as January. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question, we're gonna be wrapping it up here shortly. Um, I d would like to address to Stephen. It looks like you did um, respond directly, but I would like for you to expand a little bit more on the traffic management center that will be coming and develop what exactly is that going to be needed for? Is it just for more screens and monitoring? Um, or is it like an air traffic control tower? So that's a great question. Um, I love the, the reference to an air traffic control tower. It is somewhat similar, but if you think of an air traffic control tower, they're only looking at one runway and handling one airplane takeoff and landing at a time. And so um, the, our systems that we have deployed now, as you saw, there's lots of cameras, there's lots of screens. And so while we will need more screens as we add more cameras, but we, those screens and cameras don't do any good if we don't have people looking at them and monitoring and changing the signal timings um, live to what the real traffic conditions are. And so the bigger building will allow for more staff to monitor and manage the system, but also for other agencies to coordinate more um, across jurisdictional boundaries. So uh, it, it will be, and it'll have some capacity to grow with our system in the future as more things are added and more devices need to be monitored and we continue to need more people. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I believe for now that will probably end our question and answer session. Abby do you, or uh, Georgiana, do you have any closing comments to make? Uh, I would just say that we are so pleased that you were uh, able to join us here. Um, and if we, if you have any comments or feedback concerning projects um, that you feel, uh, if you review the tip or the project priorities, you can't find what you're looking for, uh, you can't find the project that you think is needed in your particular area, um, whether it be a state road or a um, or a county or city road, please um, reach out to us, email us, and, uh, and and give us that information. I mean, that those are the things that we really want to hear, um, and we will certainly, um, you know, reach out to the specific municipality, under you know, review what is going on in that area, what is needed, um, what the issues are. So please feel free to do that. And I think that that is the most important thing I would like for everyone to take away is that we are here to listen to you and your feedback is extremely important in the planning process. So we appreciate your time very much. All right, thank you so much for attending everyone. We're gonna leave this up for a minute if you need to write down our contact information. Um, and we just thank you for attending tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you.